There's plenty of time for questions. Well, good afternoon from the East Coast and welcome everybody to Course Marking for Research on Impact. It's our summer conversation brought to you by the Research and Impact Committee for CCC OER. We're glad to have you here to talk about course marking for open and affordable course content and how it provides institutions with access to a wealth of data that can be used for reporting to funders, policymakers, and for other research purposes on campus and off. Our conversation will focus on uh, initiating and the challenges of sustaining course marking at your institution for research on impact. Our conversation will start with a brief panel discussion and conclude with a conversation and questions from you today. And I'm sure everybody will have a lot of questions because I know that this is a very popular topic. Our panelists today are Bob Awkward, Debbie Baker, Lisa Young, and Sunny Pye, and I'd like to ask each of them to go ahead and introduce themselves before we begin. Bob, let's start with you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, as he said, my name is Bob Awkward. I'm with the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education. I'm an Assistant Commissioner for Academic Effectiveness. My portfolio includes both leading our statewide efforts on OER, uh, leading our statewide efforts on institutional assessment and being one of the principals leading our equity agenda work all within the public sphere of our higher education system in Massachusetts. Debbie? Hello, uh, Debbie Baker. I am the OER coordinator for the Maricopa Community Colleges. I'm also an instructional designer in our Maricopa Center for Learning and Innovation. Sunny. Thanks. Um, I'm Sunny Pai. I am um, a co-lead uh, for OER work at the University of Hawaii Community Colleges. We work closely with our three four-year uh, institutions. So a lot of the things that we do is um, at the 10 uh, institution level. And um, this is University of Hawaii. It's our state public uh, university system. I'm a digital initiatives librarian at Kapiolani Community College. Lisa? Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Young. I serve as the faculty administrator for open education and innovation at the Maricopa Community Colleges. I get to work with Debbie. And I also serve as the vice president of OE Global. And I'll turn it back to you, Michael. Thank you so much. And I'm Michael Magna from Delaware County Community College, where I'm the Information Literacy Program and Library Services Coordinator, as well as a professor of library services. Uh, and I also serve as the v VP for Research and Impact here at CCC OER. And again, this is a summer conversation. So as we are, as our panelists are presenting about their institutions and their systems, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and post them into the chat. I'll be collecting those questions. And after the formal uh, presentations, we'll have a chance to hear from our panelists. So if you have any questions at any time, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll make sure that we address those with the panelists. So Bob, if you'd like to go ahead and start our conversation today. I will, thank you. Um, first, let me thank everybody for coming. I know it's summertime, so it's hard harder to get people to come for professional development at this time of year, We're competing with, well, nice weather in some places, heat domes in some places, but, and all kinds of, all manner of weather in other places, but so we're greatly appreciative that you're here today. Uh, I'm here from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and as I've already alluded, uh, I'm really reflecting on the public aspect of our system. Obviously, higher education is both public and private in Massachusetts, but we uh, we have an interesting state in that um, we only can really uh, have real authority over private institutions created since 1946. I mean, we're in the in the in the state of Harvard and MIT, for goodness sake. So, they, you know, Harvard was created before the country was created. So, I mean, how are we going to tell them what to do? We don't. So, uh, so I'm representing, as you can see, the UMass, our UMass system, our our uh, four cam four campuses, uh, the undergraduate serving institutions, uh, the nine state comprehensive universities, and our 15 community colleges. And I'm pleased that uh, Dr. Noe Ortega is a relatively new commissioner. Uh, he's only been here about eight years. He came from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and uh, he's an active uh, OER supporter. Next slide, please. Um, 
as as such, I'm basically at the Shio for Massachusetts. So I'm really talking, we have, as you can see, 28 undergraduate serving institutions. And what I'm going to talk about is from the perspective of those 28 institutions working together, but all independently working together. We kind of call it a loosely coupled system. And um, our work on this really started, as you can see, in June 2021, when the Board of Higher Education uh, approved us to move forward with course marking as a, for all of our public institutions. Um, it, as you can see, it was only, had only been implemented in 11 community colleges and one UMass campus at, at that point. They each had independently done so. But we basically did work with those institutions, learned from those institutions, and then talked to other institutions, uh, places like Washington State and uh, New Hampshire, uh, looked at the, um, the famous course marking, um, I want to say, the terminal uh, tech a book on course marking and use all of that to help us develop our own implementation guide to begin our efforts. So our work in this space is relatively new, right? That's only a couple of years that we've been working away at trying to get our other institutions on board with this because we recognize and the Board of Higher Education recognize that doing course marking obviously enables our students to know what courses are using OER. So they'll be more likely to choose those courses, recognizing that creates some other, its own dynamic, but it's okay because the point is we want students to use these books, free books if they can, because why not if they're available to be used? Next slide, please. Uh, in Massachusetts, and this may vary in other, in other uh, institution setups that you're gonna hear from, we basically have done two categories of marking. Um, we started off, we were just going to do OER, but then as we kept talking about, we realized, well, OER are not the only thing that there's no textbook to purchase and no cost for students, right? If the students, if the faculty member uses all library resources, those have no cost to the students, uh, they're free, or if the faculty member chooses to just make copies of things and use it and do it that way, again, there's no textbook to purchase and it's no cost for students. So. We understand that open does not, OER and open are not the same. OER, we understand that the five R's is coined by Dave Wiley. But to keep it simple, and simple is important, for course marking purposes, we just check no cost, and it can include those things that you see, or low cost, which is $50 or less. Again, that may be different in other places. Some folks, the purists don't like low cost, but uh, we had, institutions that were doing it 50 or less. We had folks who were doing it 40 or less. And we did a compromise and said 50 or less because for example, myself, I teach principles of macroeconomics. I went from a wonderful 225, probably $250 now textbook, uh, Cengage textbook to um, Lumen Learning that's $35, which puts me under the low cost teaching and learning materials. And I made the case as did others, you want me as a faculty member to make that choice. And you gotta give me some, you gotta give me some credit for making this move. So I should be able to get under the tent with, with other folks. In fact, the only reason I basically use the Lumen Learning is because they already have all the interactives. And since I have a full-time job at the Department of Higher Ed, I don't have time to create interactives. So I need to have it, have it come with all the materials so I can just teach with it. So, so we do both, no cost and low cost. Next slide, please. Um, in order to support this, now you might think, oh, that's easy. Yeah, everybody's going to go gung ho. Yay, let's do this. Well, if only it were so. <laughs> there are people who get it. Um, there are folks who don't want to do it. And then there's the, the folks in the middle who you're basically trying to move, right? Trying to use the folks who get it to help pull their colleagues, recognizing the folks who don't like it probably will never like it just because that's the nature of the, the way it is. So we've had to do a lot of things you can see both in 20 in 22 and again in 23 to try to help ensure people understood what we were doing, why we were doing this, what tools and resources we were providing for them, answering their questions. Um, we created sessions where people with the same SIS student information systems could meet with each other and learn from each other on how they had implemented it at their campuses. 
because we realized that was it. That was one of the challenges. I mean, you only not only do you have the faculty members that say, you know, if we do OER, all the students will take OER courses and we won't have courses. And I say, no. I mean, yeah, the OER courses will probably fill first, but if you since most of that's in the gen eds, there are multiple sections. And so the students who don't sign up as fans will sign up for your courses. Of course, you could always enact an OER course in your class, in one of your courses. That would help as well. Um, but part of the issue was just understanding how to work their registration systems and work the, the logistics to be able to do these. So those sessions are very good. Again, this year in 2023, we did a series of seminars for people who were beginning, for people who were um, had started but seemed to be a little bit stuck, and the people who basically already had it implemented. So we customized these seminars for each of these groups, again, trying to help people get traction and get them moving, because it's continuous effort required here. Next slide, please. How have we fared so far? We're still kind of where we started off from. So I'm saddened to say that, but uh, you know we're gonna continue with this work. We're not going away and they know we're not going away. Um, you know, some of these issues are real. One of the issues beyond the faculty members individually at, at our state universities, we've run into issues with governance that we have state universities who say, you know, we've got to run this through our governance process, yet they're not, too quick to run it through their governance process so we can get this thing moving. So that that's kind of that stickiness is causing us some issues to get it moving, although they say within the next year or two they're going to get moving. And we have I've got a few ideas about how to get that the group moving. Our UMass system is also in that middle group as well. And they're um they're also committing that within this this coming year, this coming academic year, they will get moving. So if I get to do this a year from now, I'm hoping that middle group will have moved into the top group and will be dragging the other folks in behind them. So um, that's kind of where we are. Next slide. And I'm, this is where I get to kind of say, because this was about research. So what is the point in doing all this stuff? Well, one big one, of course, is for students to know what books are, uh, which teaching and learning resources are open and low cost. Two, quite frankly, to encourage other faculty to, to join in implementing this in there among their courses. But the third, and this is the, where the research aspect is, is to um, um, collect data on what we call our key performance indicators on how we're doing with OER across our public institutions. So we adopted the, um, this went blank, uh, COOP, the COOP formula. Coop, which is cost, outcomes, usage, and perceptions is the P. That's opened.org, open education group.org. That's their work. Coop formula. And we selected a few. When you go in and look at this site, there's a bunch of things under each of these big dark headings. We selected a few that we want to work pursue. Last year, FY22 was our first year collecting data on all the ones that you see in the black, the two ones that are in red what we call our equity measures, we're doing this fiscal year for the first time. Last slide, please. And here's what we learned. Out of the 28 undergraduate serving institutions, 17 of them reported, um, it was 61%, which is good. That's good. We hope we'll get all this year. Next slide, please. Look what we found out. Of those 17 institutions, they had saved their students seven point over seven point six million dollars in doing OER and and low cost because we track both. That's a return on investment, as you can see. For every dollar that we spent, we were able to return one hundred and twenty three dollars in savings to students. And then, if you're looking at a full time uh, uh, an FTE basis, it's one hundred and sixty four dollars per student. So we we there's a caution in that, of course. Some of these savings is all not just in FY22. Some of this work was already ongoing. So, it, you know, that's a challenge. You know, once you do it, you keep getting year after year after year, you get those benefits. But, you know, we do data, you capture one time. At this one point in time, that's what we captured. We are delighted. So we move on with course marking in Massachusetts. That's it. For, that's our story to our next presenter. Thank you, Bob.
So Maricopa Community College District is a, comprised of 10 separately accredited community colleges across the Phoenix metropolitan area in Arizona. We serve up just over 93,000 students. Again, that, that was um, last year. Um, and that's the, we, in the 2021 to 22, we conferred just over 22,000 different awards. These are transfer uh, certificates, degrees, or occupational awards. Um, next slide. So how it started at Maricopa. And I'll jump there, um, Debbie. And um, it's so nice to see so many friends in the audience. Hi, everybody. Um, so how it started. About 10 years ago, um, we came up with this idea called Maricopa Millions. And our goal was to save our students $5 million in five years. We thought, how are we ever going to do this? Um, we had huge debates um, as to, you know, what do we call this for these for this cost savings? Do we call it OER? Do we call it no cost? Do we call it low cost? We had never thought of ZTC. Um, and we had a debate that we were going to call it no cost, low cost, because at the time we were really interested in cost savings. And we, um, the Washington, Washington State, Bob mentioned them earlier. Um, they were doing $30 as low cost and we surveyed our students and our, our students came up with $40. So we were like, great, you know, we'll go with $40. That's what our students feel low cost is. So we had a manual process. Um, Paul Golish and I used to um, independently like watch football together and thought we had no football um, stories today in your talk, which I was really bummed about, but I also love football and um, so does Paul and we would sit there and we would go through the schedule and look at our courses to determine, um, you know, which looking at the textbook costs to determine what courses meant our no cost, low cost um, ceiling there. And then we would do the calculations. So because we have so many courses, as Debbie just mentioned, we couldn't go through every single section of every single course. So we just looked at the top 50 high enrollment classes. We had a very conservative estimate of 20 students per class, and we went with $100 per textbook, and we calculated our savings. Um, but then we were able to, we were the first um, institution in the nation that um, put the search in, the course marking in our schedule. And so we had done focus groups and our students were like, we are mining the schedule to find low cost materials. And we thought we'd rather have you spending your time studying or working or caring for your family. So we did it for them. And that made everything so much easier to calculate and then to dive into deeper data, which we're gonna show you in a minute. Of course, we marketed this to students, did student awareness. We calculated those costs and our process was very student centered. We really didn't think about the data that we needed. We thought about the data that our students needed, which we're really proud of. Um, but that leads us to where we are now, 10 years later. So Deb, what are we doing now? So here we are, and we, we really want to know, looking back at the data, how much of those courses were using OER? Where was it simply zero textbook cost? And what percentage of these courses is falling in more of the low textbook cost range? So we have gone through um, over this past year to, to put in place an, a new uh, new course, new codes for the course marking. So uh, coming up, um, I believe in the spring, is that right, Lisa? Spring 24, um, getting my years straight, um, then it, the course marking will then reflect um, or have the faculty will have the opportunity to tag their courses as zero textbook cost or ZTC, low textbook cost, LTC less than $40 or less, or and um, OER. So some of these courses may be able to be tagged more than once. Um, for example, it uh, something using OER could also be zero textbook cost. Um, and so we would like to then be able to use this data for reporting, for providing options for students, for targeted faculty development, um, and also so that we have a sense of how faculty are leveraging these options to provide more affordable resources for their students. Um, 
we know going into this that this is going to require a lot of professional development um, for, for all of the audiences involved. So we've started conversations with um, uh, faculty um, at the that, that are already using um, OER or low cost options. We've started conversations with scheduling. We've started conversations um, with uh, the the IT folks that have to put these codes in place, like we know that we have a lot of uh, professional development that has to happen in order to have these courses tagged correctly once these new tags roll out. Um, we also see this as an opportunity, go ahead and go to the next slide, um, to further tell our story. So um, I forgot to, oh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, the, we have a website, it was on the, the previous slide, that has a ton of detail about our course marking. And so thank you, Liz, for dropping that in the chat. Um, so using the data to then further tell the story that you want or need to tell at your institution. So here's a snapshot of some of the data that based on the current system of simply marking it as low cost, no cost, um, that one of the colleges was able to provide to then share out and say, this is where these low cost, no cost resources are being used in that college across those departments. But as we move forward, um, we're thinking about what other stories we'll be able to tell with this data. So not just what courses are they in and what disciplines or departments are they in, but what programs are these courses living in? Um, what meta majors or majors um, or Maricopa, we call them fields of interest, are these courses living in? How does this helping the students in those spaces to be more successful and looking at um, of drilling down even further in within those spaces to look at demographics um, around those courses. So what percentage of, for example, first generation students are in courses in these departments or majors or fields of interest um, that are also leveraging OER. So um, Lisa, do you wanna talk a little bit about student success? On the next slide. I would. Um, we can jump to the next slide, but before we talk about student success, you know, one of the things I mentioned was cost savings and um, that we our goal was $5 million in five years, which we did in two and a half years. We were absolutely thrilled. Um, and, and after 10 years, we're over $30 million. And so that's some of the data that, um, you know, $30 million that we've saved our students through no cost, low cost textbooks. Um, but there's also a lot of other data that now that we're going to be able to disaggregate this to ZTC, LTC, and OER that we can dive into. So ZTC is zero textbook cost, LTC is low textbook cost, $40 or less, and OER is actually OER, um, openly licensed materials. Um, so some of the things that we want to do, um, I was talking to um, Leslie Forehand over at Long Beach City College, and she shared some of this, this amazing um, Tableau dashboard that they've built there. And just to see like what we aspire to and what others are doing, so this is um, their VTC offerings. It's by um, program. So you can see there's Associates of Sciences, Associates of Arts, um, and you can see the total um, students declared and the percent of courses with ZTC zero textbook cost. So they're using this um, to identify um, how close they are to a ZTC degree. And if we can go on to that next slide, they are able to um, dive deeper. Um, th this is more of that information. And I thought I had in this slide, but we can go to the next slide and we can dive deeper and drill down and say, oh, here is this um, associate arts and um, philosophy for transfer social sciences. And you can actually see which courses are not ZTC. So then they can go and talk to the faculty in those departments and say, hey, you know, would you consider, you know, offering a ZTC course? So this is really helping them go from ZTC courses to ZTC degrees. And they built these amazing dashboards using the data from course marking. Um, so that's really exciting. If we go on to the next um, 
page. This is some work that we've done. And um, there was a question regarding like, um, how is this impacting students? And so one of the things that we've seen just through our low cost, no cost courses is that um, community colleges, as you may know, have a six year, um, you know, that we look at completion over six years. And what we're seeing is that students who are taking multiple Z, um, low cost, no cost courses are staying in the system longer and not dropping out either. They're transferring, they're completing their goals, or they're staying in the system longer. And so we're very excited about that. And then if we just jump into our ne next couple slides, um, College of the Canyons, I got permission from James Glapagross Glad to share this information, is looking at student success rates. So this is fall success rates. The next slide is retention rates. And so they're able to look at that based on, um, they're, they're basing it down um, by race. And, um, and then if you look at the following slide, we're looking at fill rates. And so we're seeing that courses that, um, they're seeing that courses that um, are OER are getting filled faster as well. So there's a lot of ways that we can leverage this data. Um, there was also a question in the chat about, are they taking more credits? And Tidewater College has seen that that's in fact the case as well. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sunny. Take us away. <laughs> Hi everybody again. Um, let's see. Um, so just to repeat, I am a co-lead of the textbook cost zero program at the UH Community Colleges. And I work with um, uh, Wade Shiro at Leeward Community College on some of this planning work. Um, but um, uh, we have 10 separate um, accredited institutions, um, three are four year. Um, we started this whole thing as a group of volunteers. For, it was started with a few librarians who thought this is a great idea. You know, we, we heard Cable Green speak and we got to go to an open ed conference. Uh, we rapidly invited instructional designers, instructors, and even administrators started joining our group. We've been meeting every month since about 2015. Um, the um, in 2015, uh, the UH uh, Community College's Vice President's Office um, gave us um, innovation funding to start a two college pilot, then grow the program to the seven community colleges. Um, our 10 institutions use Banner. So in 2015, um, the UH Manoa Continuing Education Program, that's a four year. Um, initiated using a marking in the comments field, uh, textbook cost dollar zero. Um, this was um, outreach college is like an adult education, so it's summer session. So um, our librarian there um, started that innovation and um, uh, Leeward uh, picked that up right afterwards and Kapilani picked that up right afterwards. So basically we we're using the comments field in the banner um, registration system to inform faculty and students what, uh, what courses were uh, textbook cost zero or ZTC. Um, but of course, we were using a phrase, so that makes it more complicated because you have to make sure that all the secretaries type it in precisely, especially if you want to do counts, you know, so I was downloading, you know, our register, you know, our course offering data for Kapilani Community College and doing a search for dollar zero. Um, it gets complicated if people have looked for, uh, have done searches for strings. Um, but the advantage of using the comments field was that each college had control over what they put into the comments field. So, um, you know, as a startup, we did not have to make the argument to the system to make this a system wide um, operation. So colleges kind of signed on one by one and um, by 2020 all our 10 um, institutions were on board and were marking. Um, <clears throat> Then um, the definition of TXT zero, what is textbook cost zero? Basically, Leeward and uh, Kapilani, we had to work it out, you know, um, as in our pilot program. Um, and um, I just wanted to tell everybody that um, all of these links are, are working. And um, actually, if you download the uh, slides, there's a lot of information in the notes. So don't, don't download it as PDF, download it as, um, as a PowerPoint so you can get to the notes. There's a lot of detail there um, that um, all of us have put in. Um, so basically it was dollar zero, you know, uh, no, um, no cost at all. Um, it's, um, 
it uh, leans toward all the teaching materials are no cost, um, exams, no cost, um, materials that they have to read. Um, it, um, if you are if you have a no cost uh, teaching materials, but you have a, a lab fee, that's okay because um, that's equipment and it is instruments. And you know we have culinary and, and health services. So um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, administrators started noticing our impact because we were just we were going after um, um, cost dollar savings. We tried several times to get a banner attribute, um, first with a college institutional research person, then higher up the community college system administrative level, no success. So you can see right away that this is very grassroots. We're trying to grow tall. Then in uh, 2019, a 10 campus system level administrator, Hei Okimoto, um, she was associate vice president for student affairs and director of academic technology. So please notice we have, she's doing the student affairs side, student services side, and she's also doing academic technology side. So um, she conveyed a meeting with us and, and she said, um, you, you know, you guys are doing a good job, you know, uh, how can we help? So we asked about a banner attribute. Um, so she, she knew the right people. And um, before we knew it, we had a TXT0 attribute in banner, which went into effect spring 2018. When I say attribute, it means you just click one data element in the banner database. You don't have to type out precisely um, um, the phrase that we're asking everybody to use in the comment. It's also much easier to pull, uh, uh, to um, aggregate data, and also to sort and select. Um, so then the, that same administrator asked in 2021, our system, our 10 campus institutional research and planning office, to generate regular TXT0 reports by which we can track statistics um, by campus and across the entire system. So this was very helpful because pulling all that data down for each of our groups of OER campus advocates at each campus was a real headache. You know, we have teaching faculty, we have full-time librarians, everybody is very busy. So now, uh, now we have one report that comes out um, after each semester and also at the end of the summer session. So we have a sense of what's going on across the system. Um, essential stakeholders in all this process uh, were our volunteer OER campus advocates, uh, instructional faculty, department chairs and secretaries who have to click all those things to get it into uh, Banner. Um, our campus registration specialists, they're the ones who answer the questions once a secretary doesn't know how to make this work. Um, and faculty senates for some campuses. Um, we got resistance from uh, faculty senates from some campuses. So we had to get their support in some instances. And of course, the academic affairs administrators at the campuses. Um, at the upper level, um, for us, it was the um, community college vice president's office, the information technology services and banner office uh, for the 10, 10 campuses, um, our student affairs office, the academic technologies office, 10 campus level, and our institutional resource office at the um, uh, system level. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a very oh okay. This is a very confusing. Uh, this is this is our output. This is our prized uh, report that comes out now. We just got one for uh, summer, uh, 2023. So um, when we were approached um, about this report, um, we were asked, "Well, what do you want on this?" Uh, so uh, we we basically constructed a data report that reflected our data collection process that we were doing campus by campus anyway. Um, and, um, um, you know, our goal was to generate a report that could lend us insights into the diffusion of TXT0 practice and cost savings to students. So we want to, you know, we're looking to see whether or not there's growth across the campuses. Um, to compare a campus with us, you know, with relatively low enrollment, fewer students than uh, with a campus with higher enrollment, uh, we look at percentages, such as the percentage of instructors who teach at least one TXT0 class. Um, so that's helpful, and people can kind of gauge how the knowledge is spreading 
the adoption is spreading across the campus. So um, this data helps us calculate rates of class TXT zero adoption using the course reference number, rates of adoption by subject matter slash departments, um, and rates of adoption by instructors teaching at least one TXT zero class. Um, you can also derive on a different on a different sheet how many uh, instructors are teaching repeatedly. Um, there's um, and of course you can calculate cost savings to students using the one hundred dollar you know generally accepted uh, metric. So this data and trend data over multiple semesters is distributed to all campuses once the report is sent to us. And uh, the OER leads at each campus are encouraged to record and to report them to their administrators, their own campus administrators. Wade and I, as CC leads, um, we compile this information, we, uh, we build trend data graphs, and we send that to our vice president's office, um, who, who continues to provide us with funding for this work. Next slide, please. So um, each campus has a different workflow. So this is just to make things easier. This is my college's workflow. Again, all of this is clickable if you want to get more information. Um, uh, I appeal directly to department and um, program chairs and their secretaries to get their faculty to remember to mark their classes, TXC0. Our curriculum specialist in the office of the vice chancellor for academic affairs fields any questions that secretaries or chairs might have about how to mark those classes. For Leeward and Capulani, the courses are self-certified. Uh, it's honor system for the faculty. However, we check on any questionable markings if they're reported or if we discover them. At Hawaii Community College, shout out to Leanne, who's in the, who's in the crowd here. Um, they have uh, far fewer courses. Um, so the OER lead requires her faculty to send um, her a document verifying that the materials are TXT zero, and then she in, she herself inputs that data into Banner. So you see that little volcano in the bottom left power, uh, of the PowerPoint slide. If you click on that, you'll get to see her criteria for faculty. As classes are entered into Banner, they show up as TXT zero in the course availability list. Um, the My UH Portal Store class registration system and the UH OER website. Um, then I appeal to all academic advisors to work with their students in finding TXT zero classes. Um, you can see um, part of the flow here too is um, uh, we, have to, we have to inform our students. So it shows up for our college um this um at that bottom in the in the middle column at the very bottom it says find your classes um a video specifically uh, built by one of our library graduate students with the help of leanne at uh, hawaii cc uh, we put together a video from the students point of view because students have they have screens that they see that i don't see i don't have access uh, to you know how to register to classes for banner you know so our library student um, worked through all the different ways um, that a student can search uh, for TXT zero classes and what does that look like when they go to register for a class. So right now, a student can say, I want to take English 100. And if they if they click the right search parameters, they can get English 100 off of 10 campuses. That's kind of radical. <laughs> you know, for faculties teaching at my college, they know that a student who's looking for Botany 101 can see whether Botany 101 is being taught textbook cost zero at Hawaii CC. And if it's online, you know, so that, if you think about it, that's, that's radical. Um, um, did we get pushback? A little bit, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I got some pushback from faculty on my campus. But uh, what we're talking about is we're trying to tell students where, where, where budget is super important. They're trying to take care of their family. They're working part time. You know, this is a really important advantage to them and we wanna make that available to them. Um, okay. Um, so I recommend that you folks watch the video because it's very cute. And it also has a Hawaii perspective, which is really nice. Um, so next slide, please. So in spring 2023, uh, roughly 35% of classes at the community colleges were TXT zero. 8% of the classes at the universities um, uh, were TXT zero. 
Um, using the $100 per text thing, uh, the community colleges save students uh, over $1.7 million. And the universities save their students um, about $815,000. Um, and since 2015, the community colleges have saved students over $17 million. Um, one of the um, one of the things that we really try to to push um, and encourage, um, I tell everybody that this is a, a college wide effort. So we have the staff involved, the faculty involved, and the students involved in this process. Thank you. Okay, on to the next. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sonny. <laughs> and so we have some really great questions, but just to kind of get our conversation started with our panelists, uh, can you highlight one or two challenges you had in starting course marking at your institutions? Uh, Sonny, I'll start with you. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> For starting the course marking. <laughs> Uh, I was um, getting support from the right office. I mean, we kept going up the chain. And um, yeah, so that was a little difficult. And then finally, we hit the right person. And and it was great. Her response was, I can help you with that. So that was really wonderful. Um, and um, also, another challenge was um, getting support from your campus course marking staff to establish a new practice. So this is people on our own campus. And then we ran into faculty senate um, problems with um, other other campuses. The faculty were resistant. That's for me. Debbie, Lisa, Bob, do you want to jump in? Um, um, go ahead, sorry, Bob. Is that Lisa? Um, I would just say that um, from Maricopa, I can echo what Sunny just shared in regard to, you know, engaging the faculty senate and having those conversations. We didn't include them. We had a very, um, you know, a great inclusive steering team, but we did not include faculty senate. And that um, when suddenly our find the class marker came out, they there was a lot of concern that's being echoed right now in the meeting chat of, you know, well, my class might not fill or students, you know, or, you know, those classes are cheap or what have you. There was a lot of um, conversation and there was a lot of, um, we really needed to talk about the quality of uh, open educational resources and no cost, low cost resources. Um, the benefits, we had folks, we had a lot of information from students and data and focus groups about the challenges they were having financially. So we were able to share that with our faculty and we got our faculty senate engaged in our steering team, which changed, which really, um, I think helped. And then also, you know, we, we listened to them and they said, this is very prominent. Like you can't even search for whether a class is online here. Why do you have this here? Can't you have it with other areas, which we were happy to do. And so, you know, like it's, it's an opportunity um, for win-win in terms of making sure you have the stakeholders there and engaging with them. Yeah, I would say uh, in terms of challenges, uh, the faculty senate governance issues that I mentioned before, before quite frankly, uh, I have a lot of CAOs who are talking the talk, but aren't necessarily walking the talk uh, around support of, of, of course marking. And uh, of course, for me, it's easy to say, because to me, I see it as low hanging fruit um, and totally in their wheelhouse because it both is about imp improving, expanding the op options that faculty members have to teach from, which is teaching, which is in the CAO's wheelhouse, and uh, in lowering costs, improving student learning, which is students, which is also in the CAO's wheelhouse. So, um, so to me, it's, it's, it's hard for me to understand why they aren't being as, they aren't doing it, leading at their campuses in the way they talk about this. Now, some of this I understand around political capital, they have to trade off what battles they want to battle with their faculty. And I'm, there's no doubt someone saying, you know, this, this course mark is fine, but I got other battles and I'm not gonna use my political capital on this. In fact, that's one of the things I'm gonna do is get together with a group of the CAOs from the state universities and have them tell me how they can help move this needle on this issue. 
uh, because I can't do this on their on their campus. I can't just mandate it like Washington State. I don't have a legal mandate, so I, I have to do it through cajoling, information, education, influence. So, um, uh, and then quite frankly, this will be an interesting one for to see how others react to this, that there's a, one of the issues with doing course marking is getting faculty to provide textbook information in general, never mind just on OER textbooks, but just to get them to provide timely textbook information anyway, in general, which, you know, how long has the Higher Education Act required that? I don't even, long enough that I can't remember how far back we've been required to do that, and yet they still are resistant. So, um, so those have been some of the challenges. And so to, to kind of continue along this thread as we talk about faculty, we have a great question in here in our chat uh, regarding, you know, our fat when we're when you're publishing these reports or communicating this data internally to faculty, do faculty feel pressure to then switch and adopt OER, open text, affordable course content? Um, and have you maybe done any research with faculty to see what their perception is now? Uh, Amy offered um, a, a slides from a presentation that uh, she and a co-author made at Open Ed uh, 2022. But I just, from the panel's perspective, are faculty feeling pressure to adopt so that their course will enroll? Because we hear that that's some of their concern. And have you done any research along these lines? I don't know if, who would like I, to Well, my, the quick answer is I hope they do. <laughs> um, and, and I'm sure they do, um, because we do hear the, the buzz about, well, if you do, if you do course marking, well, you're not going to, you know, we're not going to, my courses aren't going to populate, and then I won't be able to teach, yada, yada, yada. Um, I don't specifically, and that's a great research question, I just have to add that to what we're collecting, if the system can handle it, to, uh, to see if, in fact, um, how doing this is um, impacting other folks or other people feeling moved by it. I know that doing education of faculty is increasing their interest and willingness to adopt OER um, mm -hmm. and thereby hopefully pull other colleague faculty along with them. Uh, but just doing, I'm not sure, at least in Massachusetts is course marking is having that same um, pull effect, I don't know. I'll be curious to see what other folks are learning. So, so if I could jump in here, um, I I don't know I, I'm how faculty in Maricopa. I don't know if they they feel pressured to adopt OER, but I can say that um, it it's it's a good thing um, to start the conversation with them. You know, we talk so much about student success and providing, you know, removing barriers to student success. And this is an, an easy barrier to remove. Um, and it's a good way to start that conversation. And we, we do a lot to support faculty that want to move in this direction. And, um, and we talk, Oftentimes, sometimes faculty are concerned about, well, I don't want to write a whole book or I don't want to do this. This this feels too big to me. So we we encourage them to maybe start with what they can do. So, you know, you don't have to transition the whole course all at once. Maybe start small and help work with the uh, librarians on the campus at the, at the different colleges to start identifying excuse me, identifying the open resources or the free resources that, that can help their students. You know, from a, from a course markings perspective, we really wanna to move to a place where we can differentiate that data to say how much is really OER and how much is library resources or how much is low cost? Like where is this, where is this push for affordability really happening across the colleges? Um, but it's okay to not have to go all in and jump into the deep end all at once. Um, but th this is a great place to, to start removing barriers to success. Yeah, that's, that's well put, Debbie. And um, uh, we do have uh, librarians across our 10 campus system that are 
um, at, even just for starters, are assisting uh, faculty with um, um, starting small or uh, finding commercial uh, copyrighted materials that uh, the libraries, we're, we're already spending money on these resources. We're spending a lot of money on resources. So why, you know, it's a great way for faculty to take advantage, you know, of, of our resources so that they can, they can teach with those materials. Again, we are TXT zero, we don't require OER. And Lisa, that's a great comment about it allows faculty to connect with other faculty who can mentor them through this process. So that's excellent. Now, I'm going to pivot a little bit and get off our, our highlighted questions on the screen, because I think this brings us to a question that appeared in the chat related to how do we separate out low cost, no cost, you know, textbook zero, ZTC, library license content. How do we s separate all that out when we're pulling reports and communicating that data? Do, do you separate that out? And I'll speak from a librarian perspective. I know that library license content is getting a lot more traction with faculty. And are you pulling out that specific set of data? Because I'm sure that would help with library funding arguments on campus. So, uh, I don't know who would like to start there from our, our panel. Okay, Elisa, you want to jump in? <laughs> I'll jump in. And so, you know, this is the situation that we're in that we didn't have it um, disaggregated and it was really challenging for us. Um, and so we did a lot of work in creating those definitions. We, some of, we have 10 separately accredited colleges, but our librarians are very engaged in the work that we're doing. And um, on some of our campuses, they are really looking at um, partnering with us as we look at ZTC degrees and how they can help and leverage their budget and ebooks. So an example of that is I teach a course that um, I have a great textbook um, and I'm like the, one of the OER people, me and Deb, and um, it's a great textbook. And yes, I could take the time to write something, but I love the textbook. And it was under $40, so it was low cost, but I wasn't really like feeling the, like the, the low cost being you know, my role. And so I went to the library and I, there was an ebook and we had one. And so I said, what would it cost to have an unlimited license? And it was $12 annually to have an unlimited license of the textbook. And so we were able to leverage that. But I think that, um, so that's just an example of like ways that like when you have when you're partnering with them, you can really help to get that data data to them and have them help you. Um, but I think that the work that we did in creating, you know, breaking down our definitions, you know, do the work that we're doing in professional development of our faculty and schedule builders, the awareness campaign that we're about to launch for our students is all aligned with that. Um, and if you look at the website that we shared, we have all of these scenarios that walk the faculty through, like, is my course OER? Is it ZTC? Is it LTC? How do I figure it out? And I think all of those pieces are a part of that. But we are so excited to have this data available to us come spring 24 so that we can hopefully do some of the things like Long Beach or College of the Canyons um, are doing and some of the work that, you know, Sonny and Bob have shared as well. So like we just can't wait. Or I can't wait. <laughs> and so this kind this question came up a bit and there was a great um, conversation going on in the chat and so Lisa you're talking about and I want to hear from everybody you're talking about having to provide definitions for faculty so faculty can understand what course material falls under which which category now here's my question to you and I know Maricopa did some research to ask students what they consider low cost which I got to say is great because I know that's often the debate the debate is where does low cost start is it uh Bob as you were saying fifty dollars is it forty dollars at Maricopa is it thirty dollars but from a student perspective um and, and this was a great conversation wouldn't just free be a good course marking for them? Do you think there's value? Because this was the conversation that was happening in the chat. Is there value to having these multiple definitions out there to educating students? Now, it's great that you're having an awareness campaign. Uh, so I'm going to start with Maricopa. Uh, how, do you, how do you get the word out to students? How are you educating students? Are students receptive to that kind of conversation? 
So um, I'm going to start, Deb, and then jump in. Like, like Sunny, we have um, student-generated videos. We do a lot of awareness campaigns. Um, why we didn't just go with free? Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, free isn't free. And so it's free to the students, but it's not necessarily free to everyone else. It's a zero textbook cost to the students. And then when you talk about free degrees, that's like a whole nother piece um, there. But I think that like we had a lot of debates about OER and, and using that specific course marking. And I dream of the day that our students actually search our schedule for OER, for being able to leverage OER enabled pedagogies or um, open pedagogies and being able to have them searching for those classes. So um, I'm just gonna jump, throw that out um, and be quiet. Uh, I'll just add to, to that, I, I think, I think Lisa is absolutely correct. Like that, that is kind of our our hope for the future is that students will uh, look for courses that are are more open, and that that will give us more and more opportunities to to introduce faculty to open not just open pedagogy, but how to teach with an open educational resource, how to leverage the fact that these these resources could potentially you know, depending on the licensing, be um, uh, revised, be be remixed, be contextualized to to be more inclusive, uh, to localize the information, or to provide information for the the students in the specific um, situation that they're in. Excellent. And so I'm just looking at the time and I just want to offer the panelists a uh, last chance for remarks and we could just start in order, Bob. Final thoughts on course marking as it relates to researching impact for students? Um, course marking is just so important, both, as I said, both in, in encouraging more student demand uh, and thereby increasing more faculty participation and for being able to um, collect data to see what we're doing and how we're doing. And just, to, you know, my use of the course marking just makes it so much easier to do the, the kinds of um, uh, data analysis and be able to disaggregate the data to see what's going on and what's going on underneath of, the, of those numbers. So course marking just makes it so much easier to do that then. And that's part of what's slowing down our ability to do some of the assessment we want because these people aren't just going to do it manually. They're just not going to do it. So, uh, so that's why we continue to keep pushing on it. The other thing that we did that was very helpful, by the way, is we did an implementation guide. We wrote it based on everybody's practices and talking to other states. We developed a guide that has definitions in it, very specific, so people know. So the campuses are using those consistently across. So we're making sure when we're collecting the data, we're putting apples to apples together when we're collecting the information. Excellent. That's all for us. Sorry about that. Debbie, final thoughts? I'm, excuse me, I'm looking forward to having all, to being able to disaggregate all the data coming, moving forward. Oh, excellent. How about you, Sunny? Oh, <clears throat> well, we're not there yet, but um, we'd like to work with our institutional research office to look at student success factors like um, uh, GPA and um, drop fall withdrawal rates for Pell, uh, part-time Hawaiian students, Filipino students. We have slightly different categories. Um, and time to completion would be very cool. Um, uh, we do have one project where we're, um, th I, they're gonna start looking at student learning outcomes. So I'd like to um, see what they're doing and see if we can apply that also. Excellent. And Lisa, final words? I'm just really excited to look at how the course mapping works. Like if we can do something like Long Beach has done that, I can't wait to see it. And then I also look forward to getting into the qualitative data again and doing focus groups again with our students and our faculty and some of the things that have been shared by everybody, I'm really excited to try. I'm so glad that you mentioned qualitative data because qualitative data is so rich. Of course, there's you know, it's it's time consuming, uh, but I think we have some great ideas about really researching faculty, right? And their, their impression about course marking. But I wanna thank our panelists today. 
Uh, what a great conversation related to course marking, uh, seeing what's happening at your institutions and your systems, uh, and how we can apply them at our institutions, our systems, our locale. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today, and please feel free to take our short survey and let us know your thoughts about today's webinar. And I know Liz put the link in the chat, so you can go ahead and connect there. And just know that this uh, a recording of this webinar will be posted online, so you can uh, read recap and hear some of the excellent stories and the different resources that are available. So from the Research and Impact Committee for CCC OER, I want to thank you. I want to again thank the panelists for such a uh, great conversation. I have uh, pages of notes here and thank you everybody who attended uh, and we look forward to seeing you in future CCC OER webinars and events. So thank you so much.